how do you get those beautiful blurry backgrounds to your photographs? Well, it might surprise you to know that it's actually a lot easier than you might think. You see, tripod is it's all to do with apertures. And much like riding a bike, once you've learned how to do it, you'll be able to do it effortlessly. And more importantly, this one skill will really help you to level up your photography and unleash your full creative potential. So if you'd like to learn more about blurry backgrounds or bokeh as we photographers like to call it, then today's video is a must watch as I'll be breaking it down and making it as simple as I possibly can. But before we get into the hows of creating a blurry background, I'd like to spend a moment looking at the whys. Why would you ever even want a blurry background anyway? And when would you potentially want to soften or blur the background? Now I say potentially because this really is a creative decision and despite what some photographers may tell you, there really are no hard or fast rules to this. To paraphrase a great man, to blur or not to blur, it is the question. So all I can talk about really is when I would make the creative decision to blur in the background, but when I think you should probably consider it too. So reason number one is to make your subject stand out from the background. Now this happens a lot with portraits and product photography where focusing on your subject and letting the background dissolve into that beautifully creamy bokeh will remove distractions and focus the viewer's eyes towards your intended target. Reason number two is to create separation if you have a cluttered background. Many woodland photographers will intentionally soften the background of their image to highlight a particular tree or feature among the chaos of the forest and woodlands, and to sometimes even accentuate the misty conditions. Simon Baxter is an absolute master of this technique, and I've linked to his YouTube channel in the description below. So go and check out his channel after you watch this video. And finally, reason number three is to create atmosphere and stories in your photos. For example, softening streetlights, blurring landscapes, colours or crowds can all help to create a certain mood or emotion in your image, and it can really help to enhance the story that you're trying to tell in your photograph. Now, before I get some of the more experienced photographers' knickers in a twist in the comments section below, I would like to point out that there are, of course, other ways of introducing a blurred background. But because this video is aimed squarely at the beginner photographer, I'm going to keep it simple and focus on the easiest and most effective method for new photographers, which is through learning how to use your apertures. So what's an aperture? Well, whatever your level, we're all photographers here and we're all generally quite visual thinkers, aren't we? So to use a visual analogy, I want you to think about your eye. More specifically, I want you to visualise what happens to your eye when you go from a bright sunny day into a dark room. So you imagine that your pupil of your eye will widen as you move into the dark room and the opposite will happen as you go back outside again, your pupil will get smaller. And this is controlled by your brain, which is doing some pretty funky stuff to control how much light enters the eyeball and hits the retina at the back of your eye. And it does do a pretty good job at controlling the light, really, because we are usually able to see fairly clearly on very bright, sunny days and relatively well in some quite dim environments. And this is very similar to how the aperture works in your lens. The aperture is essentially a hole inside the lens and it's made of several interlocking blades. It basically lets you control how much light enters the camera and you can either widen the aperture to let more light in or narrow it to let less light in. Now apertures are measured in units called f-stops. You may have heard of photographers describing numbers such as f11 or f2.8 and these numbers describe how wide or how narrow the aperture is. The principle I really need you to remember here is that the lower the f number, the wider the aperture. Let me just repeat that again as it's so important. The lower the f number, the wider the aperture. Okay, so the wider the aperture, the more light will be let into your camera and the brighter your exposure will be. But apertures control far more than just the exposure. Apertures also control the depth of field. And what is the depth of field, you ask? Well, depth of field describes how much of your image will be in focus. So a deep or larger depth of field will have everything from the foreground all the way to the background in clear focus. Whilst a shallow depth of field will have more of the image blurred and less of it in focus. Remember what we said about F numbers and aperture size? The lower F numbers or wider apertures reduce the depth of field of your images. Higher F numbers, narrower apertures, deepen the depth of field. Another very simplistic way to look at this is that the lower the F number, the fewer things will be in focus, and the higher the F number, the more things will be in focus. Now, before we move on, can I quickly ask a favor? If you are enjoying this content and finding it useful, please help me grow this brand new channel by giving me a thumbs up, or commenting below and also please consider subscribing to the channel for more videos just like this one right back to apertures so if you want to create a blurry background to your image you just need to choose a wider aperture but pay attention because this is where it gets a little complicated but don't worry because i have an easy fix which i will explain to you in just a moment so you've opened your aperture nice and wide to give you that wonderful beautiful blurry background but now your image is way too overexposed so what are you supposed to do 
Well, you could do a couple of things here. You could go back to Exposure Triangle if you even know what that is and tweak the ISO and the shutter speeds until you get your exposure just right. But if you are still new to photography, which I'm guessing most of you are, an easier option for you will be to switch your camera to the aperture priority mode. This is a semi-automatic setting where you can set your aperture to where you want it to be. So in this case, it'll be nice and wide for an image with a lovely blurry background. The camera will then take care of the rest so it will sort out the shutter speed and the ISO to keep your picture correctly exposed. And please don't feel that this is cheating in any way, it certainly isn't. Many experienced and very accomplished photographers still shoot in aperture priority mode in a lot of circumstances. But as a beginner photographer, I always strongly recommend that you start in the aperture priority mode and spend a lot of time shooting this mode and really playing with the different F numbers to get a feel for how they work in different conditions and with different subjects and with different amounts of zoom. In time, you may want to move out of the aperture priority mode into the fully manual mode, but staying in aperture priority mode for a little while will really help you to wrap your head around some of these concepts like apertures, F numbers and depth of field. Unfortunately, you can't really rush this part when it comes to learning photography, but if you would like to understand how apertures work with the shutter speed and the ISO in something that we call the exposure triangle, then you're in luck because I have a whole video on the exposure triangle you can watch right now.